You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, and on today's episode, we have Jacques Bonifay, the CEO of Transitel. Transitel is a company that provides global cellular connectivity solutions for mobile virtual network operators, Internet of Things, and enterprise distributed workforces. We talk a lot about some interesting topics that we don't cover a lot on here. We talk about deploying IoT internationally, talk about how to scale cellular IoT projects in Europe, specifically data privacy in the EU, um, common mistakes companies make when they're trying to expand their IoT operations abroad, and just generally industrial versus consumer IoT as it relates to use cases and um, uh, the growth and expansion of a potential deployment. So a lot of you out there I know are probably working on a solution or have deployed solutions and maybe looking to expand that solutions presence um, globally through other regions and so forth. So this is an episode that I really recommend that you listen to. You'll find a lot of value in it. But before we get into this episode, if any of you out there are looking to enter the fast growing and profitable IoT market, but don't know where to start, check out our sponsor, Leverage. Leverage's IoT solutions development platform provides everything you need to create turnkey IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Jock, to the IoT for All show. Thanks for being here this week. Thank you. Hello. Hello yeah, from it's great Paris. To have you. Yeah, Paris. I know it's uh, it's uh, I've, I've never been to Paris, but I've I've always wanted to go. So I don't know wh- I don't know when the best time to go is, but at some point I do plan to make it over that way. Next May or next June would be great. Next Not May so or next June. Not and the uh, weather should be nice. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I appreciate you taking time to do this today. And what I wanted to do was have you start off by giving a quick introduction to about yourself to our audience. So I am Jacques Bonifay. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founder of Transatel. Uh, by background, I'm an, an engineer, but I've been doing a, an MBA and uh, working in consulting in the past. And I founded Transatel in 2000, so 21 years ago. I'm also a president of MVNO Europe, which is the European Association for Mobile Virtual Network Operators in Europe. Though I search, I do quite lots of lobbying to the European uh, commissions uh, to push the concept of IoT MVNO and also the classical MVNO for voice and mobile telephony services. Um, regarding Transatel, so as I said, the company is 21 years old. We are, we are basically in two businesses. The first one, the historical businesses, is in the MVNO business, where we are an MVNO enabler, meaning we provide a turnkey solution for people who want to launch MVNO. So an MVNO is a mobile network virtual operator. So it's a mobile operator who don't have a network and who buy capacity from mobile network operators. We manage uh, more than 100 operators, mobile operators, in across France, UK, Belgium, and, and we are the leader on the Western market. Uh, in addition to that, uh, eight years ago, we have launched a worldwide data MVNO focused on the IoT market segment. And uh, we have developed our business along three market segments. The first one is automotive. And we got a, a couple of customers, such as Jaguar Land Rover, where we provide connectivity for Europe, but also Fiat Chrysler Automotive for Europe, which is now part of a Stellantis group. But we are also providing connectivity for customers such as, um, sorry, such as uh, DAF, uh, the the car manufacturer. Um, In addition to that, the second market segment is industrial IoT, where one of our biggest customers is Airbus, the the, the aircraft manufacturer. Mm -hmm. We provide connectivity for the aircraft for the predictive maintenance of uh, Airbus uh, service that Airbus is providing to the airlines. Airbus has chosen Amazon Web Service for cloud computing and um, and Palantir for artificial intelligence and Transatel for cellular connectivity. The third market segment is for a consumer device or the workplace. So basically, we provide cellular connectivity for laptop, tablet, or a smartphone uh, using leveraging on eSIM mm-hmm. uh, with a, a retail service and the UBG brand, which is a, just a great service for you. If you come to Paris, please use UBG. You download the UBG app and you will enjoy local connectivity in all Europe, which will Fantastic. be much cheaper for you. That's that's awesome. Um, so tell me a little bit about kind of the history of the company. So you've been around for a while. You have kind of two different main focuses. Um, what was the opportunity you saw when you started the company and um, decided to kind of venture down this path? So 21 years ago, we had a, a good 
wrong idea uh, <laughs> or wrong good ideas, I would say. We wanted to bypass robbing uh, by putting multiple phone numbers from different countries on the same SIM cards. Okay. Uh, so we started that, so that will that allow us to provide local connectivity at local rate in each country. Um, so um, from a theoretical standpoint, that was a great idea. Practically, it has been very difficult for us to get agreement with operators across Europe. Mm -hmm. So we, we developed a service, we launched a service, we did some uh, revenues, but not so much. So we quickly changed our business model to become an MVNO enabler, providing a turnkey solution for people who want to launch MVNOs. Uh, and that was kind of a second uh, second strategy. Then the third strategy, uh, that was in 2013, 2014. Okay. We saw that we were a regional player, that we the company was growing well, that was profitable, but that was not a great thing. So we wanted to do something much bigger. And to do something bigger, you need to be worldwide. So how to be worldwide? Then the idea was to launch a worldwide MVL, but to make it more simple, we wanted to focus on data MVNO. And at, at this time, we were talking about machine to machine, or we were talking about cellular connectivity. The, the, the wording IoT was not existing at this time. And very quickly, IoT came. Uh, and now we, we call ourselves an IoT worldwide MVNO, uh, mm -hmm. where we serve all Europe, we serve Asia, we are also in the United States. We got many customers in the US, consumers and enterprise. So we are truly, truly worldwide IoT MVNOs. So that was the third, the third. Uh, I mean, the, the third aspect of our strategy, the, the third level, I would say. Fantastic. I appreciate you kind of sharing those insights. So I wanted to um, use the opportunity of speaking with you today to talk a lot about IoT, kind of from an international standpoint. So I've had a lot of guests on that are very um, focused on different markets around the world. Also, a lot of guests who are focused much on the North American market. Um, but I think there's an interesting perspective to kind of talk about deploying IoT internationally. Um, so I wanted to kind of just to start off is from your perspective, what are the main things that need to be need to be thought about when a company is looking to kind of expand internationally with an IoT solution? So IoT is a, it's a quite broad term and it's much broader than what machine to machine. Sure. If I talk about connectivity for a car, you've got different type of connectivity for a car. You have a telematic aspect, which is to which is kind of a machine to machine services. Then you have a software update, which is another kind of machine to machine, but kind of different. Then we have what we call infotainment. By infotainment, first is uh, you want the car to be connected to know the traffic information when you right. want to go from point A to point B. But then it's a service which is for the end user, for the consumers. You may want to have internet radio services and you might want to buy more connectivity to have more internet radio. You also may want to have Wi-Fi on board and this is really an internet access services. Then when you are dealing with consumers, uh, you, have, you basically have to, uh, in Europe, but also in the US, to comply with uh, regulations for mobile operators. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have regulation and constraint, which is not only imposed by the telecom regulator, but also for the Ministry of Interior in terms of uh, identification of who is the driver. Which means that from a regulatory standpoint, it's much more complex. Uh, machine to machine is kind of straightforward, but when you go into the IoT where you manage B2, when you start to mix B2B IoT and B2C IoT, where mm -hmm. consumers are involved, then the regulatory weight is much bigger. And if you consider Europe as a continent, with all the countries we have, with all the language we have to manage, then it's much more complex. Uh, to deploy internationally. So Transatel has developed over time the capacity to deploy the services in every country of Eastern Europe, but also in the US, but also in Japan, in India, and in many other countries in the world, where mm -hmm. we made the effort and we made the investment to comply with the local regulations from the, from the telecom regulators, but also with the constraint imposed by the Ministry of Interior of each of the countries. Okay. So that's where you, you see that Connectivity for IoT is just more complex than just to provide connectivity. Sure. There is the, right. the local marketing, compliance with local regulations aspect, uh, and also security rules imposed by the countries. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting when we talk about the connectivity space, because in IoT, especially in the commercial and enterprise side, there's a lot of different types of uh, connectivity that fits potential use cases. So trying to optimize that. And then once you start 
moving outside of the borders of a local market, you have other challenges that you have to deal with. So one thing I wanted to ask is, is when we're talking about, let's let's focus for a second like on cellular IoT projects, for, for instance. When, when you're trying to scale those in Europe and even then outside of Europe, what are the things that people really need to be thinking about or need to take into consideration and kind of what advice do you have for people approaching that? I would say two things. Uh, the first thing is what I just said about how to comply with the regulations in Europe, in US, in Japan, okay. and so on. That's what I okay. was talking about. But secondly, right. you could say that if I want to comply, then fine. I can uh, deal with AT&T in the US, with uh, Vodafone for Europe, then with uh, NTT for Japan, and with uh, Telefonica for Latin America. What you will see is that if you do that, first you have mm -hmm. to face multiple integration. You have to integrate with AT&T for the US, with Vodafone for Europe, with uh, NTT for Japan, with uh, another portals for Latin America. So that's the first challenge where you basically multiply your cost of integration. You multiply them by four or by five. But sure. also you will see that even Vodafone in Europe will not comply with the local regulations in every country. Mm. Why that? Because by nature, a mobile network operators do comply with the local regulations where it has footprint. Ask Vodafone to provide an offer in France. That's more difficult for them because they are not in France. They are using SFR. And then SFR mm. is a different operator than Vodafone. So this is why Transatel is one of our key differentiators. Because we have an MVNO by our DNA, we are nowhere. That means we are everywhere. And where we did invest is not so much in having a network because we buy connectivity from the network. But okay. we did invest in, comply with, in complying with the local regulations and offering to our customer a single interface for world connectivity with compliance with the local regulations. So when we're talking about regulations, how does that also kind of play into the data privacy side of things with like GDPR and, and kind of associated challenges across that? Uh, it, 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 does, uh, it, it does that. So GDPR is really for the name of the individuals and what are the data you use for individuals. So, Usually, Transatel, as we provide connectivity, depends on the case, but in most of the case, we don't have a name of the end user, except okay. for connected car, where a connected mm -hmm. car, uh, Jaguar Land Rover or Fiat Chrysler decided that they did not want to deal with the consumers to provide additional connectivity. So they are we're asking Transatel to deal with the consumers. So uh, uh, someone is buying a Jaguar in Europe or a Land Rover or a mm -hmm. Fiat or an Alfa Romeo. They buy the car with three years connectivity, typically. Then for the first three years, the connectivity is, in, is included in the car. In some right. cases, the guy arrives at the end of his data allowance, and then he needs to buy additional connectivity for the rest of the month. And then he's getting a contract with Transatel. Okay. Transatel, as an MVNO, because we started as an MVNO, we do comply with GDPR in all Europe. And right. so we take the responsibility of complying with GDPR. And by the way, uh, because I think Europe is, uh, is the most strict startups in terms of compliance with data privacy, we use exactly the same level of data privacy for the US because it is the same gotcha. system we are using worldwide. So we take the, the, the most um, demanding uh, requirement right. that we apply worldwide because it, in, a, in a way it says you're for us. Gotcha. That makes sense. I, I, I figure it probably saves a lot of headache if you can optimize for that and then you go somewhere else and maybe it's not as kind of difficult or as strict and then you obviously are going to fit into there with no problem most likely now typically for a u.s player who want to yep. provide uh, iot services in europe where you have a relationship with uh, with the consumers we will take care of this uh, gotcha. compliance with the local european regulations and, and remember i am the president of mvno europe which is a, mm -hmm. a lobbying entity so I am very well aware of the local regulations, and we can also influence to change the regulations if it doesn't make sense gotcha. from, from a European standpoint. So we are a player, a body in Europe, which does influence the regulations. And especially for connected car, we are influencing quite a lot. Gotcha. Okay, fantastic. So let me ask then, we talked about kind of the challenges and, and things going on um, as we're, we're talking about moving um, or scaling solutions abroad. What are some of the more common mistakes that you see companies make when they're trying to move and expand their IoT operations outside of their home country? Typically, um, the first reaction of an IoT player is to get a contract with a mobile operators. Okay. The mobile operators is going to provide his SIM cards. And the device might have a, 
lifetime, which is more than a couple of years. So if you take a car, the lifetime of a car is, is 20, year, 20 years or maybe 10 years at the smallest level. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that when you are with a, mo a mobile operators, you are stuck with these mobile operators and you cannot switch easily. And of course, the mobile operators will tell you that there is a standard called EUICC, which allows to reprogram the SIM cards to change mobile operators. Actually, right. if you really check, it, it doesn't really work. Um, you take connected car, and there is a famous example in Europe where you have one European car manufacturer who moved from another portals to another portals. He has never been capable to, to switch all the vehicles from one operators to another portals because the, the capacity to switch over the airs is, is working on the lab, but it's not working on the field and it's not working for 100% of a car. So if you really want to be independent from the mobile operators, if you want to change, to choose which operators you're going to work in which country, mm -hmm. either because you want the best price or because you want the best coverage or the best service or whatever, right. Uh, then you need to rely on an MVNO or be an MVNO yourself. And we, we think that car manufacturers are going to become mobile operators okay. uh, or they're going to rely on people like us who have technically the capacity to change network overnight without changing the same cars, without doing this complex over the air reprogrammation of the same cars. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of things people forget. So. Gotcha. Uh, uh, players typically in the US will ask HNGC, please provide me connectivity in Europe or maybe right. we'll have other phone. But they, they don't see that smaller player uh, such as Transitel will be much more agile, much more. Uh, right, right, right. Flexible, but also will provide the freedom to be independent from mobile over, right. which is the key for uh, to keep the best services on, the, on, on many years. So you have to look after the first two, three years. Makes sense. Okay. And then, so how do you? From from your just ex your experience, your in interactions with customers, and just kind of view of the market, how do you advise people on how they can best choose their connectivity partner um, when they're working in Europe and then obviously going outside of Europe? So the way is, first we we uh, we like to give them a couple of SIM cards so that they can test our service or end to end okay. service. Um, not only the connectivity, but also the platform we are providing them to manage the SIM cards. Okay. And uh, we go on their use case and we check the, the compliance of uh, their services with the local regulations. Uh, and then we, we try to think strategically with them how is going to be their service in one year, three years, or five or ten years from now. Right. And what is and discuss with them from a strategic standpoint, which is the best strategy for them to maintain long-term value. Okay. Uh, and, and we believe that long-term value is the best managed if you keep control on the core network. If you have a supplier, such as an IoT MVNO, which can adapt uh, the core platform uh, to the need of a customer over time. If you take a big mobile operators, there is no way they can be flexible. Those guys are providing their services. Uh, maybe in the short term, the price is good. But which is clearly, if when you deal with a big mobile operators, you know the price you're going to pay the first year, you have no idea how this price is going to decrease over time. Right. When with an IoT MVNO, you can put some contract in place so you have some power on reducing the price over time. For example, and this is one of the reasons that Airbus, the, the European aircraft manufacturer, choose Transatel, mm -hmm. they are in their contract the capacity to negotiate themselves with any mobile operators in the world and whenever they negotiate a contract with better terms than what we are providing to them, then we, we take this contract and we provide them with a pricing they have negotiated. And we just ask mm -hmm. them for an enabling fee, which is 10 times smaller than the airtime free. So, and we actually leverage on our customer, on the power of our customer to, be, to negotiate better rate. For example, if I take Fiat Chrysler uh, in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, I didn't do the negotiations myself with the Italian operators. I, I will right. use Fiat Chrysler to negotiate. And hey, surprise, surprise! With Fiat Chrysler, uh, with their power, we did get we did get much better price than we were capable to get by ourselves. Gotcha. Uh, so uh, this is also the flexibility we bring over time, and uh, some and security on the price on the long term. Because today you know the price you can get today for the next two years, but you have no idea with the development of five G. What was right. going to be the price per megabyte in five years from now? And by the way, if the business model is changing and that if mobile operators are not anymore invoicing per megabyte, but are selling bandwidth, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. the market is going to be completely different. And yeah. if you're an end user dealing with a big mobile operators, then you are stuck. You cannot change it. If you're an IoT and Veno, it's easy. We can renegotiate the deal and we can switch network overnight if we are not happy with the current provider. Gotcha. Okay. That's that's fantastic advice and kind of a, a, a good way to kind of sum it all up on how, how to approach it. And and the last question I wanted to ask. We, kind do of ties it. It. we do it everywhere in the world. Okay. Everywhere in the world we can do it. Fantastic. Yes. Um one of the one of the last questions I want to kind of um, ask you about because we've talked a lot about a d- couple different applications um, and use case kind of situations here, but how does a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now does it differ the approach you take depending on if the company's focused on industrial, uh, more kind of enterprise type applications for IoT versus consumer, or is the approach very similar for both sides? From a technical standpoint, the approach is very similar. Okay. We have developed and deployed a worldwide data and VNO, which is the same technical solutions. And this solution, this technical solution is addressing very different market segments. As I said, it could be connected car services with very various services such as uh, telematic, software update, or infotainment, including Wi Fi on board. But it could be also connectivity for airplane for predictive maintenance, or it could be connectivity for laptop and tablet, or for consumers traveling in Europe uh, under the UBG brand. All that is based on the same technical platform. The marketing is very different, but the technical aspect, the technical platform is the same. This is how we, we bring synergy. So we, we have lots of synergies in all those business because the technical platform is the same. And when we negotiate agreement with mobile operators, most of the time, it is the same agreement for all our business cases. It's only on very, very specific case, such as connected car, where we have specific agreement. But once again, it's just the negotiation aspect. The technical deployment is the same. So the more we do business on different market segments, the more we generate synergies in all those business and the more we, we reach critical mass. That's awesome. Okay. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, as... Um... First of all, I appreciate all these these insights you're sharing. I actually haven't been able to have a kind of detailed conversation with a guest that has this much experience around the, uh, especially the European market, but as well as kind of glo- globally scaling um, around on the connectivity side, is which is a, a big area of focus and a, a topic that we've covered in detail or in, in in pieces here and there, but never really had kind of a full kind of um, fully absorbed conversation like we're having now. So this has been this has been great. And I think our audience is going to get a ton of value out of this. If our audience kind of has questions, wants to learn more, wants to follow up and kind of just get more information about how you all approach this, uh, you know, ask questions about how to how to approach this for themselves. What's the best way that they can do that and reach out? They can go on our website, transatel.com, and uh, go and uh, they have an info request process, and we will be very pleased to come back to them quickly. And maybe one note I, I should have said before that Transatel is now part of the NTT Group, the Nippon Telecom and Telegraph Company. Okay. We are a subsidiary of NTT. We still uh, we are still running very much as an independent company, but we are part of the NTT Group. Gotcha. Uh, which is maybe a, a level of rations for some customer if needed. Nice. And and is there anything kind of happening throughout 2022 that you're looking forward to that you're most excited about or we can kind of stay on the lookout for coming out of Transdell? What I'm looking is uh, is maybe to be able to announce by the end of the year a new deal with a new car manufacturer. Oh, okay. Uh, which could be a, a global deal. So after Jaguar Land Rover, Fiat Chrysler Automotive and, and DAF, I hope that I will be able, by the end of the year, it's not going to be in the next couple of months, but sure. by the end of the year, I announce a new deal with a new car manufacturer. That, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, we are also in the process of signing many, many more IoT deals, industrial IoT deals. They are smaller deals. Um, and altogether, that that will accompany, accompany our, our growth uh, for the next mm-hmm. couple of we basically grow by about 30% every year. That's great. Well, well, congratulations on that potential success and growth that you all have kind of on the horizon. It's it's very exciting stuff that's going on over there. So uh, I really appreciate your time kind of chatting today and, and learning more about the company, learning more about kind of your approach and, and really the advice you were able to provide our audience on how to, to scale um, their solutions globally and what to really think about as they're moving outside of their local regions and areas. So, so I really appreciate your time and thanks for being here. Thank you very much. 
All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.